This is Citizens for Community Media. We have Dave Wemhoff, Chris Kuhl, Gus Zilke, and myself, Peter Helland. Uh, <clears throat> this is going to be a little bit different uh, type of conversation because uh, we're targeting the fact that we're all Notre Dame uh, grads and all our fathers fought in World War II. Either they fought directly or indirectly. Okay. Your dad was directly, your dad was directly, and your dad <clears throat> and my dad was a Navy pilot, and he would have been part of possibly the invasion of Japan, but they had... One, one, one story is they had the atomic bomb that saved it. That was what I was brought up with, but I think there's other renditions. Uh, the scripture that's relevant here is uh, <clears throat> the Beatitudes. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And in the epistles, James 3, it says, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Uh <clears throat> Notre Dame is kind of has a reputation under Father Hesburgh. You have you have the Hesburgh Peace Institute. I get them confused. You have the Croc Peace Institute. Just like Notre Dame is really into international peace. Uh, the one of Birchall had, or what was the name? Yeah, but Gus, Gus, you Gus are Hall. more on the whole mission of peace. Tell us a little bit about how Notre Dame. Not, not that we're satisfied with how Notre Dame has, has, has achieved this, but nevertheless, the Notre Dame community that we're part of really strives to work for uh, not just national peace, but international peace. Right. Well, I think the, the, uh, uh, the story of the Kroc Institute is interesting. That Remember, that was donated by the lady who was married to Ray Kroc, who founded McDonald's. And... Uh, she insisted on naming that institute after Father Hesburgh. He didn't want that, but she just said, uh, Father Hesburgh, I insist, and I'm going to give the, the donation to start this thing. So that's why that's the Hesburgh uh, uh, Croc Institute. And that's why it's there that way. But uh, more important than what she did, I think, is what Father Hesburgh did prior to this. Father Hesburgh was very, very busy in the 60s. Wasn't he on the Atomic Energy Commission? There's, he did that. And then he involved himself often with negotiations with the Soviets on uh, 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 nuclear nonproliferation. And um, at times he did things like uh, when the uh, Soviet uh, military people who were negotiating with the Americans, when they had, like, when the wife was sick, Father Hesburg would send flowers to the, to the wife. I mean, I mean, he built relationships, and he was good at that. I mean, and uh, uh, he made it one of his great uh, works, uh, and, and he... Uh, and that's the reason he was honored uh, by Croc. Uh, so what I, I, in you know, and of course, after Father Hesburgh died, uh, I responded in grief to his death by planning a peace retreat up in uh, Champion, Wisconsin, which is at at, uh, at the uh, the shrine of Our Lady of Good Help. And we brought together a Palestinian, an Israeli, uh, an African peace builder, Archbishop Odama, and then groups of people from troubled cities, Baltimore, uh, uh, Milwaukee, um, um, South Bend, and... Uh, St. Louis? St. Louis, uh, Ferguson, the priest that was in Ferguson for 16 years. Uh, Father Jack Schuler, Monsignor Jack Schuler, who also happened to be in charge of uh, Pope John Paul II's visit to uh, St. Louis. Remember when the Pope came to St. Louis? That was a big deal. Uh, and uh, uh, Monsignor Schuler was in charge of that too. But he lived in Ferguson and he was there during the Troubles. And so we, we gathered, but it was really in honor of Father Hesper that we gathered and we were, we were responding, I was responding just to the fact that Condoleezza Rice, 
had said at Father Hesburgh's um, uh, memorial service at the ACNC that uh, I watched it on YouTube. I didn't, I didn't go to it in person, but I was watching it, and she said that he was concerned. It was a great burden for him about peace in the Middle East. So that's why I brought the Israeli and the Palestinian together at that particular uh, conference. But part of the, part of the calling yes. of, of a graduate of Notre Dame, in a, in a yeah. direct sense, is to be concerned on the international level. And you majored in American studies, so. Well, I, I majored in international relations, switched from geology, but, and became visual artist. And I, I learned to integrate masses of information from brilliant professors on different topics, mm -hmm. from economics to wars and grievances. You have to go back, you have to dig back through context because the professor says, you don't understand, you got to get to the what's going on. What is the crisis? Mm -hmm. How do you, then you can learn how to diffuse the crisis, but what are the facts, who's lying, and get to the truth, dig it out, and then start working through negotiations on it, okay? So then when we graduated from Notre Dame and our parents won the great patriotic war, as they say in Russia, um, we built a new world, built on the American dollar, Bretton Woods, NATO security, the UN security, there's gonna be peace all over the place. And decolonization was in effect, countries are becoming independent. As we were children growing up, saw all these new countries appearing. So the world looked like it was headed in a good spot, except for there was that bipolar thing between Russia and the US, which is called the Cold War. And we had some scares there. But, uh, you know, we thought our parents were gonna build a wall for us that the adults were in charge, and they were gonna maintain peace at all costs because when the American general talked to a Russian general, or even a German general, retired, they would had seen the battlefields, the slaughter, the destruction right. of infrastructure, apartments, houses, hospitals, harbors, everything just rubble, 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 people dead everywhere. And so, the, the, like I said last time at the end of World War II in January, those six months of European combat was the most deadliest, and the most people that died was w civilian deaths. They had no food, no medicine, no hospitals, no energy, no coal, nothing to eat. Everybody was sick and dying. There was prisoners of war all over the place. It was a slaughterhouse in Europe, from France across to Russia. Death zone, death zone everywhere. So we didn't want to see this anymore. We're sick of it. Russia was sick of it. That's why we, we invested in peace. We invested in peace. And then that brought us to the 80s and Reagan. And we had the SALT talks in the disarmament through the 90s where we reduced our nuclear stockpile. Wow, look at that. We went down from, what, 20,000 to 3,000 or 5? Forget what it was. The world was run by adults, was headed in the right direction on both sides. They could sit down. Men with suits and education and experience sit down and hash out these problems and come to solutions, okay? Fast forward to Clinton. Clinton starts the war in the Balkans very, right at the end of his presidency, which was unnecessary because he wanted some kind of victory, I guess. Meanwhile, the, the Soviet Union had been uh, discombobulated since 1990 and broken into various countries which was reformed under the Russian Federation. You could stay in or you could get out. And a lot of the countries got out. So they, for 10 years, their economy was, was pillaged. They were a third world country. They could barely survive over there. So in 2000, there's a gentleman named Putin becomes the president and the leadership passed the baton to him, mostly uh, Yeltsin. And he realized he had a country that was like a third world country that was behind in everything jobs, wages, production, military, science, everything. The country had been looted by the Wall Street banksters from the 90s, and a lot of them were the friends of the Clintons, like Larry Summers, department, he was a Treasury Department at some one point. Okay, so that leads us into 2000, and that time goes by fast, right? <laughs> and so we we're at 222. And Putin's been pretty much in power this whole time. We've had number of presidents and we've come to the crisis that we're in now with Russia but there aren't any adults in leadership position in the United States government in NATO in the German Republic in France they're all like preening 40 year old um, I don't know they're all like little high school girls nobody has any adult vision of the future of security of warfare what warfare is all about what economy is all about 
it's just like there's some there's some agenda in play where all the leaders are are subservient to I would what do we call it the world new world order a world economic forum reset thing where Russia has become this huge enemy out of nowhere and it has to be destroyed and regime change and we went through that in the Middle East and Libya and all those countries under all those democratic presidents Obama uh, that started all the wars in Yemen, Libya, slaughtering thousands of civilians, war crimes after war crimes, under Obama, Hillary Clinton, under Biden as vice president, uh, on and on. Um, president Trump, no war, it was a brief respite of peace. So now we're all confronted with this elephant in the room of World War III, which most military people will say World War III has started. The, the NATO, America, the banks, all the powers are going after Russia, and then the Russian people know it, and they know they're in for a long, hard ride. And so here we are, we're Notre Dame people, and we say, how did it get this way? What happened? How did we get to a very ordered governments, people talking to each other? I think it started under Obama when he started kicking out all the Russian um, ambassadors for small little things that would happen. He would kick out 20 or 30. So now we don't have any ambassadors in Russia here in the country and vice versa. It's regressed. It's, to me, it's infantilism. Ideology of the neocons and the neoliberals, they never, they never step back. They never apologize. They didn't apologize. Has anyone apologized for Iraq, Libya, Yemen? No, they never apologize. They just go on waging war, creating suffering, misery all across the board. And they never, they, they never, they never back down. They don't have, like um, the Durant says, they don't have a reverse gear. They don't ever go back. They just double down, double down. So what we're we're in the middle of a new neocon, neoliberal, Republican Party, Democrat Party war on Russia. We're in it. I say this is where we are. They've yeah, the, the and press I'm, says, I'm yeah. frightened so here we tremendously are. by it that's, personally. That's the state of affairs. So. But, but Dave, we, Dave has, yeah, a, has a has a perspective that I think is helpful. So. Yeah. We're seeing the problem. We're looking to you for a little bit of solution. <laughs> Military <here>. help. <laughs> <laughs> well, the question is why? Why? What happened after the Cold War? Why are we here? I mean, I think that's the question that's being posed by Chris. And um, is anybody actually doing that kind of analysis? I think that that was your idea behind this get together and see if there's right. going to be some analysis why how we got here. And uh, to talk to people about the idea of just war, you know, is is it ever justified, or is it a doctrine of the Catholic faith, or not? Yeah, is Russia justified to invade a neighboring country? Th that's a question. Most of the people would say there, there's never any justification, but then the just war, which I don't know that. Well, Dave, Dave in has investigated this idea that you have no right to invade unless they have actually. Uh, physically violated you, but but well, well, no, no, that's not my idea. I, I just wars in section twenty three oh nine of the Catechism. Uh, mm -hmm. Gus, uh, Gus has that open, and he's actually. You no, know what uh, I'm saying, you you don't agree that it just has to be physical attack. No, you, I, the aggressor does not have to be simply a physical attack. So right. we have to ask, what is a war? And a war is is what it's it's understood to mean armed forces clashing. Mm -hmm. But the reality is we use the war with other situations where there aren't armed forces. And the idea is that aggressors, as I read the Catechism, you bear me out, um, Gus, but as you read it and you think about it, an aggressor could be someone other than someone who physically launches you know, military forces uh, towards an opponent. So, but we also have to say, what's peace? What what is peace? Doesn't the church defines peace right? It's not the absence of violence. It's no, that's the that's the lowest uh, definition, but it's not the full definition. Right. It's not just the absence of violence. No, it's, no, it's it's, it's, it's it's the absence of injustice. And, and it, yeah, and it's 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 a situation where you can advance the common good in solidarity, respect, mutual respect. Right. Right. And and, and so. Uh, uh, w w my question is: Would be how can we use the, utilize the wisdom of the church, to uh, ponder this crisis, so that we're not um, we're not kind of stuck in narratives like 
two armies clashing in the night. That's the, that's the concern. So we might start, I mean, you might start on the question of just war, and because it, it seems just, I don't, bear me out, I might be wrong, but it seems like both sides right now consider their cause just. Mm -hmm. Well, isn't that almost a given? Isn't everybody going to try to persuade the people that we're in a just cause? I mean, has there been a case where it hasn't been that way? That's manufacturing consent. Um, no. but I, my, my problem but, is... But, but I'm sorry, I just want to go back to something you said. Because, and, and mm -hmm. because, I mean, how did we get, you know, from the 60s? We all grew up in the 1960s, yes. where everything was, you know, peace, love. You know, how do we get from everybody wanting peace to now... Everybody wants war. Everybody wants war. Wanted, Everybody wants a war. It's like you think it's the social, the media, kind of the brainwashing that, like, okay, I believe. could try to get a war started with Ukraine and then we could go after Russia it's our dream it's our it's our goal we got to get Russia you know it goes back hundreds of years to a lot of groups a lot of people covet the resources and they have a lot of enmity to Russia because they've allowed them that civilization to develop in in, in in it's a Christian civilization it's Orthodox it's the capital of Orthodoxy which is uh, you know, it's like the protector of the faith. And there's a lot of people out there that don't like those things and feel like they're jealous of Russia and, and they have this, maybe they don't even understand it themselves, this hatred which started under Hillary Clinton with Russiagate, with her lie about Russiagate. Do you, do you think that Biden is, is almost at 30% or something like that? Do you think this war uh, is something that's advantageous to those in power? Well, before I get to that, and I'll switch to that, I want to say that we put our money into our officials that are in power in the State Department, in the military, and we trust them. We give them a lot of trust. Um, you remember, you know, the reserves, and you've had a great career. And what I say is when we're serious, we're serious because it's life or death at any minute in a country about going to war or getting out of war and people die, you know, it's chaos. So you have, we have a group of people, when I look at them, I have no respect for Anthony Blinken, Hillary Clinton. They've never fought a war. They've never been in a war. They're, they're, they're ideologues. They feel they're just using the war as some kind of chaotic maelstrom to shake everything up and try to to win some kind of, they, in the politics, they call it the zero-sum game, where it, we're going to win everything and you're going to take it all from you. So we're in a zero-sum game because when I look at U.S. and NATO's policy since the 90s, it's been just go around the world and attack the Balkans, destroy the Balkans, uh, attack Middle East, attack North Africa, destroy the countries, take the resources. It's a pattern, and the pattern went to Syria, which nobody's talking about, and I do believe if people would understand that Putin intervened in Syria to save the country, one million Christians out of 11 or a million population, let, let me, let me, then he realized I've got to save myself. I helped, I helped Syria, now they're after me. And then so he made his, he made his, um, his, his, uh, his decisions based on his diplomacy. It's NATO and U.S. had the chance to go to they went to Munich. They could have had a peace deal. They didn't want peace. That's my that's my number one assumption. The U.S., NATO, the EU does not want peace. They want a long-term war well, to bleed Russia dry and take Russia down because they want Russia. And so this is just the pretext to it because that's what explains but, but, that's what explains all the contradictions of why it happened, how it happened, all the strange things that led up to it. That it's it was planned. This but, has all been planned, but I think. I'd like to bring Senator Nye in because there's also mm -hmm. the traditional force of the military-industrial complex that always loves war. So, Gus, what, getting in with what Chris is saying, 
Well, these, uh, these, you know, these Senator, interest groups that, that fuel this direction. Yeah, <laughs> Senator Nye was a friend of our families. Uh, my grandfather and Senator Nye were friends growing up together. And uh, so Senator Nye was in charge of the, what they called the Nye Committee, uh, where in the 30s they studied and talked about and researched what happened to get us into World War I. Right, okay. so that's a relevant question. Um, yeah, it is. And I had the honor of meeting Senator Nye in the last year of his life. Because my first trip to Washington, D.C., I was in seventh grade, and my father just said, you know, one afternoon, let's go to Chevy Chase and go visit the Nyes. Well, I didn't know who the Nyes were, right? I was seventh grader. But then there, we meet this guy, and he's in bed. Uh, he, was, he was bedridden at that time. But he was very much alert and alive. He knew, you know, he was just thrilled to see my father because my father was the son of his best friend and uh, uh, and then uh, uh, Mrs. Nye took us downstairs took me downstairs and showed me all the political cartoons mm -hmm. about the America First movement and the and and Nye's struggle uh, to emphasize the meaning of America First mm -hmm. that was the first example of America first, as it were. And of course, people who know the history of that know that Lindbergh was involved in that, and uh, uh, Senator Nye was involved in that. So, uh, so, so, excuse me, Senator Nye then was part of America first? Yes. Okay. He was like the political, uh, the, the person who was in politics, whereas the, the, the more general leader uh, was Lindbergh, and of course he was known for his great flight across uh, across the uh, Atlantic uh, in the spirit of St. Louis uh, in 1927. But and he was an American hero. But he was America first, also. Now, what I guess the point of this was, I think uh, uh, there were other people in America at that time too, who kind of saw through what we might call the lies of war. And Nye understood that the, it was the munitions companies in World War I and the large banks that um, helped uh, push our involvement in that war. Did he come out and he come out and said armaments, right? Or what did he actually say? Because they his job was to locate what were the real causes as to why we went into that war. Right, and and he the reason he could do it he was from a state, uh, Dakota, uh, North Dakota, North Dakota, uh, that didn't have any armament industry. They were all farmers, mm -hmm. and so. He was able to just critique the military industry because there wasn't any military industry in his state. So he was in a position to say something about it, and he did. And then for some reason in like 1936, they shut those hearings down quick. I, and, and I don't understand that. That would require some... Uh, history study that I don't know the, about. The level enough. he got to, and I'm sure there's deeper levels than just the armaments industry, but right. the level he got to as far as critiquing was, was, blame, was saying it was the armaments interests. Interest. That, that was one and, of the main things that fueled our interest into and, the war. And there, Butler, he responded to that with that book he wrote with all these statistics of their inflated uh, profits. Oh, okay. I wonder if Smedley was in... Oh, well, there was that whole Smedley Butler Yeah, uh, but he uh, takes all these statistics, well. if you read to the audio book, I, yeah. of, about how he goes through these lists of I before wish the war, after the war, during the war, all the uh, huge profits. I'm a piker everything. in this regard. I'm not a historian. I'm a religion teacher. It's just mm -hmm. so that it's just that I stumbled into some of this stuff just because of my family, right? Um, and But uh, we do see Eisenhower in his last speech... Uh, as president, warning America about the military-industrial complex, right? Well, and and in other discussions we've had, we've we've kind of tied that to Senator Nye too. In other words, Senator Nye was almost like a harbinger of mm -hmm. uh, 
what Eisenhower was going to say in, in at the end of his but, but term that, but of that presidency. Is, but yeah. that is just one strain of influence, the military-industrial complex. But but that alone does not explain Chris's thesis that you know I think we hate Russia or we're like, targeting you know, Russia. When you're, when you're 20 years old, you say, "Why does somebody murder someone?" You ask your mom or dad, and our policeman will say, "They like it." Why does someone do this? They like it. Kid, wake up. People, why do they gamble? Why do they drink? They love it. Why do they go to war? They like it. They love it. They make money. They get power. Uh, I guess Biden thought he would go up in the polls as some kind of hero rescuing, you know, the besieged leader of the Azov department. Let's hear what Dave said. Dave, (laughs) do you you want to address, you know, why we're singling out? Why are we singling out Russia? What do you think? Uh, Uh, First of all, are we singling? Is Russia being singled out? Do you think he, they are, and and if they are, why do you think they are? Well, I mean, I mean, they can, you know. Um, Kevin Phillips wrote a real good book, Wealth and Democracy, and I think we talked about it before. And he, and he talks about how the financial and industrial interests affect and control the government ever since this country came into being. So they have. This begs the question, when the U.S. gets involved in, in wars, who's, whose interests are being served? What are the national interests? Does that trickle down to us? Does that affect us? Does that affect our interests? I mean, arguably, you could say yes, because it, it shows you know, that the American leadership is willing to go fight anywhere. I mean, think about Vietnam. I mean, think of half a million, half a million U.S. troops were in Vietnam over the course of a decade. And the U.S. supplied that and supported it and fought. And the world took note of that. So arguably, you can say, yeah, we're all a little bit safer here, I suppose, in a way. But are we? Because the same people who are pushing or wanting war to go overseas, how are they treating society here? And we all know that what wars do, wars change societies. They change whatever society is targeted, whatever society is waging the war. Mm-hmm. And uh, one guy who says something pretty interesting, as, as you probably know, Gus, is, uh, is Pi- Pope Pius XI. And he wrote an encyclical, I can't remember it now, but it was from 1924, I think. And he talked about cold wars. And he said, cold wars destroy morality. Yeah. And that was, that was prescient. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or the proxy wars. The Cold Wars is a proxy war where other people are fighting and you're in the shadows. Like Russia, Russia, America, 1980s, and Central America or South, Southern Africa, Angola, those places. They got mercenary forces battling it out. But um, mm-hmm. I think Russia is the target. I think Russia basically took a preemptive special military operation because they realized they were put in a box because this country next to them uh, was just about to join NATO and get full NATO authorization and which they've already been receiving NATO training since 214 their army they have a very well trained army very well equipped very brave army very strong fighters but they put a uh, hundred thousand troops up there in the Donbass so Putin put his chess pieces up there, and then he said, well, we're going to work out a political solution. And then the people like Blinken and all these, I call them imbeciles, they, didn't, they, 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 they let it slip. They wanted to fight. They wanted Russia to fight. They kept provoking and, and laughing at him and disrespecting, like we say, peace is respect, and looking eye to eye and talking. And, and they kept disrespecting them. They kept calling them a murderer or this or that. And so basically they wanted, they were, wait, when is this guy going to start fighting? What do we got to do? Put a, set fire to his house. So he, so it, you know, they got what they wanted, but it's backfired. It's, to me, it's a big boomerang because Russia's already, you, you could disagree, but they won the war the first day they went in. The media has been telling you that Ukraine has been beating them and they have all these 50,000 casualties, it's all lies, but both, Russia is not releasing much information, but Ukraine has been, you know, putting all the information out, and my take is, you know, you're talking about a nuclear power with a, a big army, and they're going to handle the situation, I think it'll be, I think it'll probably go till Christmas, it'll be totally over, and by that time, 
they're going to take most of Ukraine back. Russia will. But, but there's well, also. Well, but but I'm sorry. But because I mean, they've, they've had some expended. Objectives. They, they yeah had some yeah. Objectives. This is they, a, they have objectives. Their, their objectives I thought were threefold. One, right. One to make Ukraine neutral. Neutral. Two right. to stop the fighting in the Donbass right. and protect those people. Um, and then I think uh, three. Denazify. Uh, well, I think that was denazify. If yeah, they would have agreed on that, uh, Ukraine, Russia, Europe powers America, we wouldn't have had the special military operation. But they just, to me, they blew it off. They went to Munich. They just, they weren't seriously dealing with the issues. And that's like a dagger in the heart when you, when you go on a world stage and you know, remember when he asked them for, Russia asked the West for six, six specific answers on paper? And then they come to Munich and said, we don't have the answers on paper. Right then, you know, it's the kid coming to school saying the dog ate my homework. They're not interested. They were not going to give in to Putin on anything. They didn't want peace. America doesn't want peace with Russia. They've been ginning up Russia animosity since 216. 24-7, 24-7, Russia, Russia, what Russia, about, okay, Russia. What about, they don't want peace. They want war. What about The I media mean, wants the war. The media wants the politician. The Both parties want the war. They're united okay, on, the, on this. On the, on the ideological, they love it. On They're the ideological money. level, we've read that CIA guy said uh, we're we're fighting for freedom, and he really and he said freedom things like uh, transgenderism. You know the values of the West that have become the values. You mean and, the global home? That's why we're fighting for global this, for the whole values. yeah that. And the Russian Orthodox, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church said, we're fighting to prevent that kind of ideology that is accepting of these historical sins of Christianity. We don't want that overtaking us. And, and we fear for it. We fear that could happen if we don't take a stand. So what about that level of tension? That's the psychology of both countries. I mean, if you look at what's happening, Ukrainian people are suffering massively. And the Russian-speaking Ukrainians in the Donbass, in Mariupol, they've been in their basements for two months, just barely surviving. And when, they, when the Russian army comes and liberates them, they're happy. And so when you get to the, uh, the West, it's a different story. It's more Ukrainian nationalism. They haven't, bon they haven't sent their troops there. But what I'm saying is the psychology is the Russian culture is, is a whole. It's made up of Orthodox their history, their survival, their future, their family. And they look upon NATO as, I can't quite describe what how they see NATO as this sinister force that promises you everything, gives you nothing and destroys, almost like a serpent or something, like a boa constrictor. It's a boa constrictor. It comes in, you got to join the EU, they're going to get you in debt, you're going to go in debt, and they'll control you, they'll control your government, and you'll be just like the EU. You'll be neutered. You won't have an identity. Well, well, you won't be Russian. Never. You won't be a national. There's no Russian uh, German identity anymore or well, French well, identity. There is. Oh, there, there, there is. is no. There it's is gone. an identity. No, it isn't. It's no, still they, there. But, but what they're doing is, they're, is there is a competing identity now. It's, it's the European identity. And the European identity was something the Americans wanted after World War II. And I'm, when I say the Americans, I'm talking about the elites. I'm talking about the American elites. And the American elites, they don't give a crap about us. Okay, They don't. They care mostly about themselves uh, and their interests. But um, what I think that if you take a look at uh, and, and so now you have populist movements in these European countries, which are basically nationalist movements. And the church has been, you know, silent on that, which is a great tragedy. But uh, the fact, or the church leadership has been silent on it. But what you have in Russia under the Constitution, you do not have, in Article 14, as we talked about, you do not have an established state church. However, you do have in the Constitution the statement that we are a people with a culture, with a history, and we're doing this to stay alive, basically. And I'm paraphrasing parts of the Constitution. But, but we have a place in a time in history. We are a people. That's mm -hmm. not in the Western constitutions. That's not in the U.S. Constitution. It just says, we the people. But it doesn't say, you know, we the people of this continent. And when the Declaration of Independence came out, and I know we've discussed that, when that came out, it's very clear what the founders said. They said, you know, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to sever the ties, the political bonds that tie it to another people, 
they were saying we are a separate and distinct people on this earth. So, so the Russians know they are a people. And I think this supports what you're saying. They, they have a they have a sense of who they are, and so they are they don't want to be neutered, as you say. Right. They don't want to to be just their identity destroyed. I think there's a very strong sense of that with the Russians, from what I've read, and I think people around the world are viewing it or being led to view it as this big fight between the godless West and also to, you know, a, a, and one more thing, and the religious, you know, and the religious Russia. And there's a lot of basis for that. David Brooks just wrote an article or, or something in New York Times. And I mean, he's a spokesman for the West. He basically said now the West is an ideological construct. Mm -hmm. That's basically what he said. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's what we've got to advance. So the question for the Catholic Church and places for Notre Dame that call themselves Catholic is to say, can we really endorse that vision of the West and all that goes with it? No, because it contradicts Christian faith. It doesn't, that ideology, Gus, I mean, wouldn't you say that that ideology is at war with the Christian uh, faith? If you go to war with the Christian faith, you're in trouble, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, Constantine had I mean, that cross million bridge. He won, man. <laughs> Think about it. This is existential question. Uh, um, yeah, it's an existential question. I see the West as a mixed bag. So it's got uh, some things going for it and other things pulling it down. And instead of, uh, instead of really stepping back and considering all that, People are just thoughtlessly crusading into, uh, well, they're, they're careening into war. Mm -hmm. And so let, my recommendation is let's step back and ask those questions about the West. Uh, and we, we will be surprised at what we're going to discover. It's just like Merton discover, uh, said this 50 years ago. He said, look, we got... And, and mentioning the same opponents, Russia and China. Okay, he says. He says, sure, I pray for Russia and China and that there be peace, but I pray for my own country that they see their own faults and their own uh, uh, misdeeds primarily. See, so that we're not, you know, when you judge somebody and you point your finger at them, you got four fingers pointing back at you. You remember your mother telling you that? Ah, my mom did. This is like, but, th but that's but, what's going on. But Christians, like a, a pope, yeah, can, can judge, and the church can judge, and the judge, and the po and and the church has said in the Catechism, section twenty two, forty four, around there, forty five, it has said we can judge economic and political systems, and we can evaluate events. Yeah, that's in fact, it's a, for. in fact, that's a that, that's a that's but, a calling but, of Vatican II to look at the signs of the right. times. That's right, and evaluate and discern. Yeah. But they're not doing that in the Vatican. They're well, not doing that. Well, no, they're making an effort. I oh, no, I don't even think they're trying. Silent since well. the year two thousand after nine eleven. There's been no religious leadership that's called for peace in the world. Oh, that's not true. Uh, it's a dead silence. Notre Dame. Uh, I don't know about, no, Vatican? I'm talking about John Paul II. Well, I'm, ta I'm he, talking about 2001, post 9 11. I'm talking well, about he the was still war both then. mania. No, I'm talking about just, just among religious people or Christian people. It seems like peace is the last thing they ever talk about. The, oh, we got to go kill the Arabs, or we got to do this, or we got to go kill Saddam, or we got to go get Iran, we got to nuke them, and just this endless war, violence, hostility to the rest of the world. And I don't hear I don't hear Notre Dame out there, uh, somebody making big speeches out on the lawn there next to the statues about we need to stop this war in Russia. Both sides are wrong, both sides are lying maybe, or both sides could be right. right. No, but let's right. all sit down. Let's stop it. Stop I, sending weapons. Yeah, let's I, have a ceasefire. No, do you hear it? Where is he? No, Where I am. I Where mean, are the how many I'm, priests are there? I'm very troubled. That's one of the How reasons I'm here. How many have? Where are the bishops? And, Where are the and cardinals? Peter put it in the show notes. I gave a talk on John the 23rd, Kennedy and Khrushchev yep. in 2019 at St. Babel's Church. And it's yep. on my YouTube channel. Those were the good old days. Put it 
in the show notes so people can watch it because we'll have to because look back at that. because look it's possible still people we can still push but, but, negotiation between Biden and Putin. Well, I think and we, we need, should. I think we need to look at a bigger issue. Okay, what is I it? think we have to look at the bigger issue. What's driving this thing in the West? The banks. I mean, th I mean this thing that was this it's been on the march. I know. For Where's for for 200 years. Was the empire going to stop? The American founders knew this was going to be an empire. They said so. So they this has been on the march. Carl Schmidt wrote about it. Right, right. He, he, nomos of the earth. He said all of a sudden, you know, the, you the know now all of a sudden the Euro the America is the center yeah. and America is going to destroy Europe. And that is what the founders' friends talked about. We're going to come into the world and we're going to destroy We Europe. knew the die was cast when they took over the Philippines. That was the beginning of their international, you know. But that doesn't march. mean that there is not an American people. There's still That's an American difference. people that the is elites distinct from the, the people, elites. Like it's a it's a pyramid. The elite and all the masses of the people. And the American people have a and right to them. have we a right them. to exist and prosper. We want to do that. I, I yeah, I got that. And so the first step is that, well, you want we, my opinion on what the have, first step needs to be? Are there any moral leaders A non-aligned, non-politically aligned peace movement. That is the first step. Mm -hmm. In other words, you could gather people from different political persuasions. For example, the Republicans who support <laughs> the idea of America first, the progressives that are interested in peace. There's a number of them. People, you know, uh, and they're very different than those America Firsters. But they could be part of this. Certainly, there can be a group of Christians, Catholics, and others for Christian reasons pushing peace. And you could, you could, you could gather the people in that way. I think, at least I think, that was one of the things that Martin Luther King hoped for in the last year of his life. And there's some indication. You mean the Vietnam speech. Yeah, there's some indication that that a that cost him his life. That's a that's possible. Speech. Yeah, that's I, I, and I, I, his life. I think the better uh, uh, historians have have seen that. That cost okay? him his life. I got that. The the the, tr the trumpet of conscience. Okay, so uh, this could happen, and it should happen, and the reason it needs to happen now is that is it not Martin Luther King that said. It's not a question of violence or nonviolence. It's either nonviolence or non-existence. Yeah, okay. Now, I, 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 that's what he said. And yeah. and like when Kennedy met with the peace activists in before the Cuban Missile Crisis, a group of academic peace activists met with him, and he, he was chatting with them, and he let the meeting go longer. There were people wait, other people waiting to see him, and he just he kept it going. And then he looked up at them at one point and said. To them, you believe in redemption, don't you? In other words, they were the ones who should have been saying that to him. Like, we're here with our peace agenda. Can you explain that? Well, it was in their discussion. Mm -hmm. But the issue is uh, that the point was is that Kennedy had a turning in his own life. Mm -hmm. That's what we're going to look at in that talk I gave on John the 23rd, Kennedy and Khrushchev. Because after the Cuban Missile Crisis... Both those men were looking for an out, and right. John the Twenty Third gave it to them, and that is important for right. for the way the church is, was yeah. then involved. The Pope was very much involved, and I gotta say you this see? about Jack I, Kennedy. Yeah, I, I'd like to know about that too. Okay, but but, but no, no, no. Go, go ahead. Go say ahead. what you want to say, if but I'd like to hear about that. He only had three years, and he was up against the Soviet Empire, and they were up against us, and he opened up the hotline with Khrushchev, and they made a deal that America would take out its missiles from Turkey, but no one thing would be said about it. And Italy, too. They would get these, some missiles out of Italy. He I said, know, we'll they, do that. But they didn't put it in the press. He said, Mr. Khrushchev, if, I, if, I, if you say that to the public, I'll be humiliated and I'll lose the election. So he said, okay, we won't say anything about it. It's top secret. It'll never come out. So, but that was only part so, of the negotiation. So the, the blockade worked. 
Even Kennedy said, I can't believe how good this blockade is. No Russian wants to run it because they got all their secret stuff. They don't want to look at it. So they take it off. So it worked. Everything he did, it worked. And he brought us back to peace. And then Khrushchev wanted to bring, keep that relationship going. And they wanted to start a disarmament movement. And they did. So guess what? Kennedy had to be eliminated. Well, that's... Do you see a pattern? Kennedy was eliminated because he wanted peace with Khrushchev well, that's and how, Russia. That's how some historians look at that. And who got eliminated he, after giving an anti-war speech? Well, he gave the famous Martin speech. Martin Luther King. No, but Kennedy gave that American University speech right. on June 10th. That was only a week after John the 23rd but died. My last point about Kennedy is there's a good video about how he had seven major crises with Russia in different parts of the world. And he never went to a world war or a regional war. Twice things happened in Laos. I like the way he says Laos. Laos, where he brought everything down, he calmed it down. Things happened in Vietnam, things happened in East Berlin, where everything blew up. Kennedy and Khrushchev ironed it down. They were very big, hot crises, they were. much more than what you see Biden having to deal with or Obama. They, these guys go out and start dump gasoline. They throw gasoline. They, they go to the gas station and start smashing <laughs> everything and pouring the gas and lighting the fires. You know, look at us, look at us. To me, yeah, they're like right. vandals, you know. So well, Kennedy, yeah, Kennedy was true. doing everything he could not to start a major war with Russia. Yeah, yeah. And Khrushchev worked with him, and they, they calmed Laos down. And it would calm Vietnam down. They were calming the proxy wars down. No, they, and so he never went to war the, between these two countries, two years. And then he was assassinated in Dallas. So, and right. then LBJ so, took over. And then we had the... Right. So, so what did John the Twenty Third do? Well, what he did... On the Cuban Missile Crisis. Well, his response to the Cuban Missile Crisis was to write Pachem and Terrace. And then, the, you know who the first person who read it was? Peace on Earth. That's his encyclical, Peace on Earth. But you know, he sent a... Pr the well, people. Well, hopefully it was him. It was... No, after he, he and the people in the Vatican knew about that document, he sent it by way of Norman Cousins, who was a journalist from the Saturday Review. He was the guy who did the diplomacy. Oh, yeah. He took the copy of Pachem and Terrace to Khrushchev. And Khrushchev read it <laughs> and discussed it with Norman Cousins. This is all you know, in this book. And uh, uh, certainly at that point, Norman Cousins had the permission of Kennedy to do this too, Kennedy. And so, and Kennedy welcomed uh, John the 23rd's involvement in this. And Khrushchev was impressed because John the 23rd was dying. And, mm. and he was giving his last kind of lunge for peace. And he, so he read it. And then uh, you see the similarities between Kennedy's speech at uh, American University and some of the lines of Pachem and Terrace. The, it, it, the, it's related. So Kennedy telegraphed his desire for peace back to Khrushchev with that mm -hmm. speech, and, as and Chris they were just pointed start out. Disarming. They were going to have secret yeah. meetings to start the disarmament movement 20 years before Reagan. Right. Oh, the yeah. No, no, they, they were ready to take That's this That's why he was apart. eliminated for that Cuba, Vietnam. Yeah, it was tragic, okay? Right. And we still don't know uh, much, as, as it were, as a people. We do about, know. About, we know, yeah. but we don't. Yeah. And, and, mm -hmm. and I think some of it is this sense of... Um, uh, Khrushchev for this well, interesting man. <laughs> well, no, I, I was going to say the, the trauma-based mind control. In other words, yeah. mm -hmm. I remember when Kennedy was assassinated. I was only five years old. Mm -hmm. And yet I remember it uh, because my parents were out of the house and there was the house, the babysitter was there, the house the lady who helped us when my parents weren't there. And she didn't know how to work the new portable TV. And I knew how to work it. You know, it's just like kids now know how, you know, I knew how to do the channel switcher. And she said, change the channel. And then we came on, and it was this news report. And as soon as she saw it, she picked up the telephone and called my parents who were eating out uh, at the club that, that, af that e afternoon. And all she could think to do with me is put me to bed for my nap. Uh -huh. But I remember that incident. And I mean, I was only five years old. Wow. But the thing is, is that, is that the media there was there were, we were all traumatized 
by that assassination. That's why they did it in public. I, well, so it'd be on TV. Okay, I, it was on purpose. Well, okay. Nothing I, that happens by accident. Well, I, I think JFK really <laughs> believed he had the power. He was in charge. And, yeah. And, and I think... You know, he got into a big public fight with David Rockefeller and the Rockefellers like a right. couple years before that. And Henry Luce commented on that. He said, he said, Kennedy gave a speech to the businessmen and he, and he got them really angry. And I think that Kennedy really thought he had control and power. And what you're saying to me, what you guys are both saying is that it's consistent that he would try to bring down and end the Cold War, disarm, bring peace, and create some kind of, you know, nonviolent global order. And, you know, the guys running it over here said, nah. So I think there's uh, a lot of reasons why the powerful private interest, the plutocrats, may have wanted Kennedy gone. Isn't that what Putin asked for just days before his special operation? He said... On TV in a rambling, long speech, he said, "Okay, the West, you don't, you don't want to be my friend, but why do you want to be my enemy?" He was obviously like begging. I thought he might start crying, like, "I don't want to go to war, but why can't we work together?" You don't want to be a friend, but why are you for you're forcing me enemy status? You won't talk to me, you won't listen to any of my, give me any respect. This is imagine trying to get anything done with a big Russian leader. And you're going to treat them like dirt. And compare it's, that it's, it's to the respect that was given between Kennedy and Khrushchev yeah, secretly. Right. And, and, now, and now Putin's being called a, a war criminal and whatever else by Biden. I know. Right and, before it's the war like, starts. Please, even. God. Yeah. He was called a murderer once when he, when he was running for election against oh, at Trump. Least once, yeah, yeah, but 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 once. you see, you see, Isn't the thing that is, is that, and, and of course, I was I was watching the. Uh, the, uh, there was a Jimmy Dore, the comedian, played a, oh, yeah. a, 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 a a thing where the Chinese ambassador was talking to this really right. angry uh, person from the press, this lady from the press. Right. And the Chinese ambassador, they, they said, won't you condemn the Russians? Won't you condemn Putin? Mm -hmm. And the Chinese guy, the ambassador of the United States said, I don't think we should be involved with condemnation. I think we should solve this with wisdom. Right. Yes. What a line. Uh, that's I mean, a great and it's line. like, it's like a, a line. yeah, it's a great line. A great and, line. and of course, I apply that to my understanding of Christianity. It's like when we sin, does God initially come to us with just pure condemnation? Or does he show us the cross and welcome us back if we're willing to repent? Well, I think everyone needs to repent on this one. And, or we're going to have I mean, the, the, the troubles of, of World War III Nuclear are... Nuclear war, 30% chance, according it, to the UN. According to the head guy in the UN, right? right yeah. Isn't that awful? Do you awful? think we're dealing with a culture that's post-moral, post-moral culture in the West, in America? So to me, it's yeah. a cultural desert. Yeah. It's ideological, what is it? Total self-aggrandizement, money, 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 banks. Because like uh, Michael Jones might say, there is no French identity government. Marie Le Pen lost for the third time. She can't get more than 42% of a vote. What? And she's running as a French person with a French history. What do they want? They want a global boring Macron who worked for the Rothschild banks and still does. They want that kind of guy. They don't want a French person running France. They want a banker. Okay. And same in Germany, they have an idiot in charge. <laughs> Well, and, and yeah. like they don't have any governments anymore. Yeah, they I, don't have any representation. We don't have representation. We are not being representative. Well, but, well, but well, we don't even it's know if the, if the election was rigged over there. Right, over it there. It could have been rigged. Okay, but a rigged election but, in France. Here, you mm. asked a question that, at the beginning of what you said that I thought was it was answered by Merton in the title he gave this book. He wrote this book. Oh, he wrote this book, Peace in the Post-Christian Era. Post-Christian Era, and, that's and, what we're in. And, so, and, and he wasn't allowed to publish it because the church authorities and his religious order didn't allow it. So they put it out in mimeograph, and they finally published it when? 2004, oh, after God. the Iraq War mm. had, had started. Then the pressure was on to get this book out. And what's interesting about this book, it's full of natural law mm. discussions 
about warfare, just war, and the problem of, uh, uh, of the bomb, too. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, Merton wrote this, and it's just interesting. You, you asked the question, and I said, well, yeah, Merton dealt because, with this. Because when we asked He why, wasn't even allowed to publish it we completely. We asked why the American government would allow a debacle to occur at the Munich Peace Conference. You don't go to a peace conference and disrail the peace conference. Either you don't go or you show up and make peace. You quit lying and quit playing games with everybody. Right. Everything that comes out of this t administration is a charade, a joke. Afghanistan was a lie. All of it, everything they do is some kind of perverse theatrical production. So what I'm saying is when they, Russia went there to try to make to forestall this. So is it that we have a government that is so immoral, so anti-intellectual, so... So gone that there's no hope for this country. No, I mean, no, look, this people yeah, are in yeah. charge. You, yeah. you want to talk about social reengineering. Social reengineering is the best when you don't know what's going on. Right. And the best social reengineering is the liberal order, capital L. That's the best. So that is the, the ideology that is running uh, the American system so, of political organization, media, social organization. TV, that is movies. the system that runs it. Okay, that is what is is reengineered societies. That is what has been placed on Europe. What the Americans have placed on Europe. That's your social injury. That's your problem right there. And yet you've got all the Christians and all the Catholics supporting this system and not questioning it. That's your problem. And you know mm -hmm. what? Everybody questions what. And, and there is a lot of evidence that shows that the communists were were paid by the the shifts and the. Uh, and the German bankers, and that Hitler was supported by by the Americans and the Jewish and 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 the English bankers. But the reality is that liberalism was developed by rich Englishmen, and it was implemented over here in this country. And that's what you're dealing with. That's the baseline you're dealing right. with. That is the ideology that David Brooks is talking about. But despite that, there is still a sense of personal identity. Then you can go. There's still a sense of personal identity of, of a people, and they're fighting. Right. Which, and you have to less. understand that when you this electoral process that's in place, it's it's not it's not working for God's I'd law. Like, I'd like to sum up that we all want peace. I think that anybody who sees the video should do a lot of research on their own. Read, look, uh, what's the name of the professor from the University Mayor of Mersheimer. Mersheimer is awesome. Scott Ritter, the Duran, D U R A N, the Duran. Great mm -hmm. analysis of the, all these problems. He's a war, economic war, psychological war, war on the ground, and uh, why it never should have happened. So we all want peace, but we got to realize that the Russian people want peace and they figure they can get it by taking care of their own person, you know, taking care of this operation. That's the way they're looking at it. Okay, you know, we but, got, we so got we're hopeful, problem. we're looking for peace, but we want the readers to reach out, look at the Russian side, look at the Ukrainian, look at the history, and then delve, you know, then delve into it. Okay, we Thank got you. 30 seconds left. So um, <clears throat> we're trying to involve the Notre Dame community, but sometimes yeah. they don't get involved. You know, hopefully they will get more involved because they have the tools. They have the university. It's an international university yeah, in a yeah, sense brother. now. So we'll uh, pray for that. Let's let's hope this conversation carries on here locally and maybe even outside of the local community. Throw their weight behind it. Okay, uh, Peter Helland, uh, and Citizens for Community Media.